I'm Terry Mast, the National Secretary Treasurer of the Inland Boatmen's Union, the Marine Division of the ILWU. Before we begin, I... <laughs> Thank you. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the Salish tribes whose ancestral lands we stand on tonight and to pay respect to their elders, both past and present. So welcome everyone to the House of Labor. <laughs> it's symbolic that we are here in the Labor Temple, where many of you gathered with us 37, I hate to say it, <laughs> 37 years ago today, not today, but 37 years ago, to memorialize the murders of Selmy Domingo and Jean Viernes. Some of you, many of you in this room tonight were here with us then at that memorial. And so I'm thankful that you are still here with us tonight and rode that wave of justice to find justice for the murders of Jean and Selmy. I want to thank especially Mike Withy. <laughs> for bringing us together tonight, for writing the book that he has, because we all know that worker stories and activist stories are never told often enough. And it's important that we document our own history, to share our lessons, especially given the political climate in our country that we face right now, today, and its impact on the world. In 1981, Jean and Selmy were murdered in our union hall, the ILWU Local 37. I'm not going to assume that everyone knows the story or were there with us. So who were they? And what was it that they were doing in their work that brought them to the attention of the US government and the Marcos dictatorship? Well. They were like many of you in this room, working class, young men, politically involved to fight the injustices that they saw before them. They were trade unionists, reformers within their union, ILWU Local 37. They were social justice activists, both in the Filipino community and in the broader community. They were internationalists, fighting against the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines. All of this brought them and our movement in the spotlight, and they were murdered for it. Some may think that this kind of thing doesn't happen, and we heard that in the beginning, that this doesn't happen here in the US. Trade unionists aren't murdered here. Activists aren't murdered here, not in the US. That happens in Colombia, Mexico, the Philippines, Middle East. It doesn't happen here, but it did. And not only was our US government complicit in it, but it happened by a foreign government. After the murders, our justice efforts went immediately into effect, bringing the hitmen to trial, Baruso to trial, and the Philippine government, Marcos, to trial and to justice. <laughs> Tonight, you will hear from speakers who were either a part of our justice efforts, they were either a, played a role in our legal team, in our labor team, in our community teams, that all helped to bring the movement to success. They were important in our work, and Mike's book spells out a lot of that, the justice efforts and what it took to get us to this point. Many of you were impacted, if not directly involved in our work, were impacted by the work that we did. 
And though Mike's book is intriguing and it reads like a spy novel, it is our story, our collective story. Our movements have been infiltrated, spied on, harassed, and torn apart by our government, by the right wing, and this is not something new. But it is something that all of us need to continue to expose and to fight and to protect our democratic rights. I would like to introduce the Labor Chorus. And the Labor Chorus holds a special place in my heart because they were there for us. Many of them were activists. Lou Truscoff, Joan, Bob Barnes. Many of uh, them were part of our movement and were part of our labor fight, labor community, and also the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes. And they sang at many of our events and continue to be a part of our community. Tonight, they're going to sing a song called The Martyr's Song. And this song was written by Christopher Hershey days after the murder. Thank you, Seattle Labor Chorus. It's great. Our justice efforts were long and intense and took many of you here to get us through. 
Our Committee for Justice was incredible. It's like nothing I have ever witnessed before or since. Sorry. <laughs> And we couldn't have done it without a strong leadership team at the center and the tenacity of Cindy Domingo, Selmy's sister, and my comrade in arms. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I, I sang that song's refrain many, many times during those years. Um, but, you know, it's quite moving that all of you are here tonight to help launch Mike's book. We're very proud of Mike for doing that, and I know it took a lot of emotion, a lot of heart, a lot of work to accomplish this book, Summary Execution. You know, when you're here today in memory of Salmi Jean, and it, um, it shows that we kept our promise, both from the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Veritas, and Selmy and Jean's comrades in the KDP and the Line of March and in the labor movement. We promised that Selmy and Jean's name would never be forgotten, and the work that they did would never be forgotten. And today shows, 37 years later, that they have not been forgotten. Salmi and Jean are present in this room. They're present here today through the many people that believed in our struggle for justice all those years. They're here in the many people who participated in that struggle for justice that we took up even before Salmi took his last dying breath at Harborview Hospital so many years ago in 1981. And as Terry said, it's hard to believe that it's been 35, 37 years since they died. And even though I have spoken countless many times throughout the world about the courage of Salmi and Jean and our movement we built, you can see it's still difficult. I started to read Mike's book on the bus one day. And before I could finish the introduction, I had to close it before the tears fell down my face. You know, Mike always had the ability to remember every detail of the case, every detail, although some of, some of the things in that book are not quite true. <laughs> <laughs> so don't believe everything in there. <laughs> but he had the ability to remember many, many details that many of us skimmed over, but that was his job as a lawyer as the investigator, and to be able to write them on paper and remember what happened exactly on June 1st. It was too real that day as I was riding on the bus. And so every conversation, every, the mood, what happened in those days after, on June 1st and after it were too real for me. You know, it's always been my wish that I could stand before you and say that we held everybody accountable that was responsible for Selmy and Jean's death. And through our painstaking work, through our analysis that peeled back the layers of the murder conspiracy year after year, over 10 years almost, our broad popular front that carried us through very difficult times, and our committed, insightful legal and political organizing team from the KDP and Line of March, with the help of the families, with the, 
with the leadership of Elaine Co, we accomplished what many did not think we could. Holding Ferdinand and Emilio Marcos accountable with Tony Baruso, the hitman, and the bagman, Dr. Leonilo Malabed. We won a landmark case that served as a warning to those that threatened to violate our democratic rights around the world. We won that victory with all of your support and with many supporters throughout the world. But as our work proceeded, and even though we won that major victory, we knew that our work remained unfinished because the U.S. government and U.S. intelligence agencies were given protection and escape being held accountable all these years. But Mike is going to tell you that we have taken up the gauntlet and we will pursue, just as we promised at the very beginning, that we would hold everyone accountable. Now, Mike said I had five minutes, but since I'm the first speaker and I was the chair of the Committee for Justice, I get to take as long as I want. <laughs> but most of all, Terry says he's not in charge. He always thought he was in charge, but we were in charge. <laughs> but most of all, I wish I could stand up here and tell you that democracy was strong and vibrant in the Philippines. But as you all know, that's not true. We held much promise for the fledging democracy that came as a result of the great courage of the Filipino people during the 1986 People's Power Movement that peacefully overthrew the Marcos dictatorship. It was an event that the whole world watched and one that we in the United States took great pride in because we had organized for 12 years to end U.S. support for the dictatorship. That is what Salmi and Jean sacrificed their lives for, and that is what we were building a movement for. Today, there are those that would diminish that peaceful movement that did not lead to lasting democracy and a radical change in Philippine society. But it was a testament to the 14 years of organizing that the Philippine movement had done and the thousands of lives that were lost, including Salmi and Jean's. But any democracy coming out of years of dictatorship is fragile in a world that's dominated by imperialism and corporate greed that has no limits. We see that here in the United States as well as in the Philippines and other parts of the world. So 32 years later, after the institutions of democracy, a Congress, free elections, free press, a right to speech, all of those institutions of democracy were reinstituted in the Philippines after the overthrow of the dictatorship. The election of President Rodrigo Duterte has thrown the Philippines into the worst crisis ever. Under Duterte's war on drugs, over 15,000 people have been killed through extrajudicial killings. These are the poor people who have been targeted and blamed for the inequalities in Philippine society. Elected and appointed officials, mainly outspoken women, are thrown in prison without judicial proceedings. Senator Lila de Lima was th has been in jail for one year on trumped-up drug charges without a trial. Congresswomen are subjected to slut-shaming by the president and faced with organized campaigns led by men in Congress to remove them from office after they were democratically elected. Supreme Court justices, both women, facing fierce campaigns to remove them so that the president can move toward a federalist government that will allow Duterte to stay in office for another 10 years while a federalist government is set up, a legal martial law where there will be no elections for 10 years while they move to federalism. And in Mindanao, in the southern Philippines, in Marawi City, an anti-terrorist war has resulted in over 70,000 people displaced 
and hundreds killed as a city has been bombed, becoming the longest urban battle of Philippines' recent history. Today, the area is still under martial law, a martial law that Rodrigo Duterte has said he may spread throughout the Philippines. And recently, the most respected news outlet who has dared to be critical of Duterte and his policies, the news, the news outlet Rappler lost its license supposedly for foreign ownership, a charge that is untrue. But what is most worrisome is that Duterte has an approval rate of 86% of its population amongst Filipinos. Under Marcos, the support was way less and dwindling over the years. But under Duterte, the opposition may grow, but it's still very weak and fledgling. The left movement led by the Communist Party, who once supported the election of Duterte and engaged in peace talks, has now become the target of a 600 hit list of wanted terrorists. We here in the United States and in and the international human rights world play a most important role in exposing the undemocratic and fascist tendencies of the Duterte government. And luckily for the Philippines, there is no love loss between Trump and Duterte. U.S. Filipino, U.S. Philippine relations has changed. It is no longer the U.S. propped up Duterte, it is Duterte himself. No, everything that happens, not everything happens, revolves around U.S. policy in the Philippines anymore. But neo-fascism is on the rise around the world, and we who continue to work for participatory democracy must continue to press and organize true solidarity with the Filipino people. Jean and Salmi gave their lives for that, and we will continue to do so in the future. Recently, I went to the Philippines to do a uh, book launching of the KDP book, uh, Time to Rise. And Filipinos now recognize the contributions of Salmi and Jean. It was always our wish that they would understand that Salmi and Jean gave their lives to overthrow the Marcos dictatorship and to see the Philippines free. In 2011, we traveled, the families of Salmi and Jean, who are both here tonight, we traveled to add their names on the Wall of Martyrs, the first Filipino-Americans to be added who gave their lives to overthrow the dictatorship. And last month, over 200 people came to hear about the contributions of Salmi and Jean and in the struggle for justice. And, and in the future, we will be naming a room in honor of Salmi and Jean at the Filipino Community Center, a place where we originally had not been welcomed, but now they are welcoming a room that will be named in honor of Salmi Domingo and Jean Vernis. Times have changed, and now we all recognize, the world recognizes the contributions of our movement in Salmi and Jean, and we honor them in continuing the struggle for democracy in the Philippines, and we hope you will continue to support us in that. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, our next speaker is Sharon Tomiko Santos, one of our favorite legislators. <laughs> and Sharon's husband, uh, Bob Santos, was very close to us and was a very key part of the Committee for Justice. In fact, Bob and Elaine Coe were the first co-chairs uh, of the Committee for Justice. So Sharon is gonna share a few words
thank you all very much. Um, and I will have to say that um, just when I sat down uh, in my proper chair, Mike whispered to me, five minutes, right? <laughs> so we will keep this. Yes. Um, I want to, first of all, of course, uh, say thank you. Thank you to Mike. Um, thank you to all of you uh, for keeping bright the flame. Um, I wanted um, to begin uh, my few tribute words uh, to the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Vernes, that sort of bittersweet moment that we are experiencing right now by um, invoking some words of um, somebody whose writing I care very, very deeply about. Um, and I'd like to invoke these words in a couple of places. But I will begin by remembering the reason that we are here, and it's this book. And I found inspiration in the words of Carlos Bulosan, who wrote, yes, I will be a writer and make all of you live again, in my words. So Mike, thank you. You make the lives of Selme and Jean live forever, as they will always live in the hearts of the family and the members of the community here. I'm very honored to stand here before you, not only to pay tribute to the work of the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Veronese, uh, but Mike also asked me, um, and I'm deeply honored to represent uh, Bob here today. So I'm going to just start uh, with a few remembrances of Bob, um, because what I think he would really want me to do is talk about the committee. And so the first thing you all need to know is, up until his last days, Bob was anxious anxious for this book to be published. He would always ask about this book. <laughs> and for, um, and I, I told this to Mike, and uh, it, it might come as a surprise to many of you because uh, if, you, if you ever worked with him or received a note from him, you would know that he was a horrific speller. <laughs> but uh, you wouldn't know this because he was, uh, but that he was a voracious, voracious reader. And I think that this was one of the reasons uh, that he was uh, a great storyteller. Um, I think uh, another reason that he was a great storyteller is because he wrote about the people and the things that he loved. And you who knew him know that this is true. He loved young people. And he wanted them to know and love their communities, and through that, to come to love themselves and their history. And that's why he was so moved when he went to the Philippines, the first and only time that um, Bob ever went to the Philippines. The most memorable moment was not necessarily when he was given a presidential citation, but when he went to the hall, to the Wall of Martyrs. And he could not speak for the rest of that day. So Mike asked me to spend just a minute or two to describe who took up the cause. And this is what I think Bob would tell us. That they were, they held this in common. They were pulled together by tragedy, clearly. But the other thing that was interesting was that more often than not, we are talking about young people, young people, who are fueled by principled ideals. Were they afraid? Yes. But as somebody once told the story, I think of Terry, um, who uh, in the face of um, having to stand in front of the older generation, and to bring them um, to uh, admit that they had to make room, she was fueled 
mostly by her anger, to stand up and speak defiantly but respectfully to her elders. And it's this anger that was propelled both by their unvarnished eyesight of what was going on in the world and the twin serpents of anti-labor and anti-democratic tyranny that they were seeing unfold right here on the streets of Seattle. It motivated people like Cindy, Elaine, David, Alonzo, Emily, Rich, Emma, Lynn, Nemesio, Michael, John, Terry, Andy, and so many more. Young people, fueled by vision, powered by heart, and prompted by the need for action. I hope you're seeing some parallels in what I'm trying to describe here. They were joined, though, by courageous community leaders and allies. People like the Reverend Dr. Bill Kate and the Church Council of the Greater Seattle. People like Tyree Scott and the Northwest Lilo. You had your activists in the KDP and the Anti-Martial Law Committee. And all of you, you young activists with the Commi Committee for Justice for Domingo and Viernes, for those of you who were part of this movement to bring back to our senses the need for strong labor and strong democratic action, it's good to see you. And yes, we're a little older, a little grayer. Well, it, naturally gray. <laughs> and battle-worn. But these are badges of courage because you have kept up the work you have kept up the vision, you have kept up the energy, you have kept up the momentum, and you have so honored, not the legacy for justice for Domingo and Viernes, but the legacy of justice of Domingo and Viernes. And you do that every day with your work inspiring the next generation of people. And so I will close, before I get kicked off, with two statements. One, because I have to use Bob's words. And so I'm going to read from his book where he talks about the impact of this, and then I will close with one more statement. He talks uh, not only about the murders and the Committee for Justice, but then he talked about the all-important Wards Cove lawsuit that was started by Selme and Jean and others, and all of you who kept up that momentum. He says, regardless, the Wards Cove case and other cannery lawsuits gave me personal satisfaction that the discrimination we felt as young Filipino cannery workers in the early 1950s was finally going to be addressed. The shame of being a lowly fish house slimer gave way to pride as those younger than me fought to end discrimination in the seafood industry. Many of our dads, uncles, and friends took for granted the intolerable conditions we lived under until young activists like Selme, Jean, David, and the others took a stand. And so, In memory of the young activists, both who are here with us still today, maybe not so young, and those who have gone on ahead, I will also close with the words of Carlos Bolasan. Sleep peacefully, for your labors are done. Your pains are turned into tales and songs. Thank you, Mike.
Thank you, Sharon. Bob Santos. Presente. Bob Santos. And Bob would be so proud to be here tonight. We're sorry he didn't get to read the book, but he knew it was in the work, so. Um, I'm honored uh, to introduce our next speaker, our mayor, Jenny Durkin, who... <laughs> We're so proud to have her and know that she will carry on the progressive legacy of Seattle. And you know, as much as Seattle is a, becoming a bigger city, we still are small in a lot of ways because we still have a lot of connections that we don't always realize, but we do have a lot of connections and Jenny is connected to us because she worked in a law firm that one of our attorneys who worked on our case, Jeff Robinson, worked in. So she's been close to our uh, case and has followed it through the years and also has been very supportive. Mayor. <laughs> Terry, thank you so much for that. And Cindy, I'm sorry. It's the one labor movement thing that started on time. <laughs> What's up with that? We are getting older. Um, it is such an honor and, and, and really, I won't say a pleasure, but meaningful to be here tonight and to be part of this and to be able to be the person that introduces the next speaker, Jeff Robinson. But before I do that, I just want to say a couple of things about the two women to my right. Um, and I think it is important for the time we live in because we live in very challenging times. But nights like tonight are a good time to remember, and Mike's book is a good thing to remind us, that we have lived through troubling times before. We have lived through fights, we have lived through revolutions, we have soldiered on. And the brutal murders that were experienced by this community, they killed the men, but they only empowered the message. And these two women here, in so many ways, every day in this community have made it a better place. They have made sure that the message lived on, that the, that the people they loved could not really be silenced, and that they were as powerful, if not more powerful. And being able to work, I was law partners with both Mike Withy and Jeff Robinson. <laughs> what more could a woman want? <laughs> you know, we talk a lot about opportunity and privilege. When I was in law school, in, about to graduate in 1984 and 85, I was a little bit demoralized because I thought that law school was going to be this graduate school about justice. And it wasn't. And then I went to do an uh, internship at the Public Defender's Office in my third year to see if I could really represent people and do things for people. And the luckiest day in my life is when someone walked me down the hall of the Smith Tower and said, I want you to meet the person you're going to try one of your first cases with. And it was this guy right here, Jeff Robinson. <laughs> and that changed the trajectory of my life. I met one of my closest friends. Don't look at me, I'm going to cry. The man who literally would be the first to hold my partner's and I child because he was at the hospital within an hour of him being born went on to be his godfather, and from a person who I learn so much every day. And you picked well in your lawyers, Mike and Jeff together, amazing duo. And there is no more fierce advocate for justice than Jeffrey P. Robinson. His life is a testament to justice. And it doesn't surprise me, we were talking about how funny it was that here I am mayor, after all the things we did, and he's running the ACLU Center about justice. And we're thinking, how did that happen? For me, it's actually more curious than it is for him. <laughs> because he was destined. He was destined to be there, to be that voice. He has always been a fierce advocate. His life is full of so many firsts. It's unbelievable. You know, our federal court here was the first to make jurors watch a video on implicit bias as part of their selection. 
the person who did it, who put it together, and who started it, right here, Jeff Robinson. He exemplifies justice in everything he does. And that's what we're here to remember. The labor movement pushed forward for everybody, for everybody to raise people up. And people tried to stop them every way they could. And we remember that they used the most violent tactics possible, but they never will vanquish the idea. We have lived through worse times. We will live through these times. We will carry on. We will watch the young people who stand up against gun violence and we will empower them. We will. And we will listen and learn from the people here and from the people outside this room, and we will join arms together to say, not now, not ever, we demand justice. And with that, I give you Jeff Robinson, the Crusader for Justice. You can stand for Cindy, but not for me. Uh, thank you, Mayor Durkin, and I kind of like laugh when I say that. <laughs> um, I'm going to share one thing. Uh, the night Jenny was elected, her sister came up to me and said, Jeff, the dog finally caught the car. <laughs> So there, there are, first I just want to say that uh, seeing the faces in this room is uh, almost overwhelming. And I expected that this room would be packed, and it is, and so I'm not surprised, but I sure am pleased. And like everybody else, Mike, I just want to thank you for a labor of love wherever you are, because writing this book it was a long time coming, but it's something that you had to do. You said back in 89 that you had to do it, and you've done it. And so congratulations. So there are three things that I'd like uh, to share with you tonight. The first one is that in my current job, I am a deputy legal director of the National ACLU. And the ACLU is involved in social justice litigation in all kinds of areas all over this country. And one of the things that is so important at the ACLU today is the recognition that you cannot be involved in a social justice movement that is not led by and informed by the people who are impacted by the injustice. And so you hear slogans like, nothing about us without us. And as I arrived at the ACLU and people started talking about this, um, and I started talking about it, people were like, well, Jeff, you're a criminal defense lawyer. What, why are you thinking these things? What part of your practice would have led you to understand this? And I told people, oh, I understood this back when I was a young lawyer. Because while Mike may have thought he was in charge, I knew who was in charge. <laughs> and it took about three or four months after I started working on this case for me to be able to talk to Terry and Cindy in kind of an appropriate way because I was scared shitless of them. <laughs> and it was clear to me who was running the show. Being involved in this trial is one of the proudest moments of my life, but let's be clear. This case was won by the Committee for Justice. The lawyers were along for the ride. And so one of the things that I learned from this trial, one of the things that I learned and that is incredibly important in my work today is that community involvement in any social justice movement is critical. And so that's a lesson that these two women taught me. The second thing I want to say is that I had been out of law school for eight years 
when I tried this case. When I came to Schrader, Goldmark, and Bender, I remember kind of crawling towards Mike's office and saying in a plaintive voice, could I like carry somebody's briefcase in this trial? Can I like do some research or can I just do something because it seems so compelling? And the confidence that Mike and the legal team and Cindy and Terry and the committee showed in me was life changing. To this day, there is nothing I've done as a lawyer that I am more proud of. And the additional lesson that I was taught was how to value the voice and the opinions of people much younger than me, of people much less quote unquote experienced than me, because I was given the privilege of having a speaking role in this case. And there are many people who have come to me and said, how did they let you do that? You were way too young. And I said, it was because they had confidence in me and I will never forget that. Thank you. So the final thing that I wanna say, um, and actually it's gonna be part A and B because I can't leave this out. After the trial, there was an event in Oakland, California and a bunch of us flew down for that event. And back at this time, I had a pathological fear of flying on airplanes. And as we got on the airplane in Oakland to come back to Seattle, the weather was kind of rough and I'm saying to myself, and I guess I was saying it out loud, <laughs> Man, I'm really nervous about this. I don't feel good about this. And as we got on the plane and flew back, it was really rough. We were bumping around in the air. And as I'm sitting there, literally turning white in my seat, <laughs> I hear this sweet, kind voice of Kalyan Domingo saying, Jeff, turbulence. <laughs> I just want you to know I've never forgiven you. <laughs> and I guess part B of the last thing I want to say is that I got out of law school in 1981. On June 1st, 1981, I was on my way across the country from Memphis, Tennessee to Seattle. I never met Somme Domingo or Jean Bierens. I never laid eyes on them. I never had the privilege of getting to talk to them, to understand what they were about. What I can say is this, 37 years after their death, they filled this room. I don't think you need to know anymore about who they were and the importance of their work. How many of us will be able to fill a room 37 years after our death? I didn't get to know them personally, but they have had an impact on my life, as has this committee. Thank you very much for being here tonight. So one thing I wanted to mention was um, about three weeks ago I was able to stand with the U.S. Attorney, the head of the FBI here, and others to recognize Tom Wales who had been murdered in this community. And we talked about the importance that some deaths have on a community, how they rip the heart out of the community, and resolution of those is more critical not that every death doesn't matter, but some rip at the fabric than others. These were those deaths. These were those murders. And so I know there is a petition to ask the FBI for all the information to be disclosed. And I was able to call the head of the FBI here today to tell him that was the right thing to do. 
that we need to have full transparency and disclosure. And we need, we need to let people know what happened so we don't make the same mistakes and so we can have some closure on some of these. So that was it. Thank you. Well, that was a great interruption. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Jeff. You know, Jeff, you brought a uh, calming effect over the legal team, even though you were the youngest member, but uh, you had a calming effect on all of us, and, and we never forgot that. And, you know, we had a wonderful legal team, and I just want to recognize all of them. Uh, of course, Mike Withy, Jim Douglas, who is not with us. John Coughlin. <laughs> and Liz Schott. <laughs> Andrea Brennecke, who also helped on our case. And Rebecca Kate. I hear you're here. Oh, great. So many people participated, and, and I know there were probably other interns along the way that helped move the legal team along, and, and we certainly appreciate and acknowledge all that work that they did. Um, next, I'd like to introduce another rising star in our community who many of you and the labor movement helped get elected to the Seattle City Council, Teresa Mosqueda. <laughs> Our favorite city council person. <laughs> we couldn't be more proud of her. She comes out of labor, she speaks labor, she walks labor, she talks labor. She is one of us. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank And I feel right at home in the house of labor, so thank you, Terry. Um, I didn't have the honor or the privilege to work side by side with Selmira Jean. And I think it's important for folks who might be joining this conversation because this incredible book has just come out for us all to remember that it's critical to know our history so that it doesn't repeat itself. But that it's also important to know our history so that we can build on the shoulders of those who've had successful movements in the past and to recognize that the power that we have today is because, those, because of those who have come before and that is in this city, in this um, state, and in this nation and internationally because of Silmi and Jean. Jean and Silme gave their lives because they dared to reach out, to reach out to their union brothers and sisters, here and in the Philippines, to publicize what was happening. They met with the head of the large union to gather evidence about the shooting on picket lines. They worked with the ILWU union leaders and members to send an investigative delegation to the Philippines and not just learn there, but report back to build a movement, to build solidarity, and to create change. And they acted in the noblest of the tradition in the labor movement, proving that it is critical that we reach across lines, reach across borders, and know that our work is a global struggle. Because an injury to one is truly an injury to all. They worked in a time where they were targeted for this unionism, for this activism, because they were courageous. And sadly, as I reflected on their lives and the struggle and the movement that they participated in, we see similarities in the movement and the struggles of today. Many of you probably know and have read the stories of immigrant activists, immigrant leaders, who've been illegally targeted by ICE. One right here in our own community with Maru Mora Vilpando, who we have had the chance to serve with and stand shoulder to shoulder fighting for immigrants and refugees. I've worked with her in the halls of Olympia, standing up for farm workers and our community rights, and we will be there with her fighting every single day against the attacks from the ICE administration. Yeah. 
in the halls outside um, just this uh, earlier this week, uh, last week, when she had her deportation hearing, she didn't talk just about her case or her own family, or the fear that she felt about being ripped away from her daughter. She talked about the fear and the consequences that ICE has, not for her, but for the entire community at large. She said that, that the struggle is surrounding this call for not one more, because it's not just about our individual struggles, it's about our collective struggles, and we will unite to fight against these ICE attacks. We also see similarities in terms of what Jean and Selma did to unite struggles when we see what's happening right now in the attack against labor, the labor movement, and workers. In the face of corporate intimidation where day-to-day -day workers are forced to sit in um, required meetings to hear about um, the ills of unionism and yet organizers can't even step a foot onto property, we will fight back. In the fight against municipal challenges, where the Freedom Foundation is given access to write the code and determine laws and municipal governments, we will fight back. In the face of judicial challenges like that that is being considered at the Supreme Court of the United States with Janice, we will fight back and organize and be stronger now more than ever. And in the day-to-day -day challenges that workers face in our community to afford to live in the very city that they work, to be able to speak up and speak their truth to power, to demand equal pay and rights in the workplace, we see these not just as labor struggles, but a fundamental human rights struggle, and we will fight back and unite our movements. We've seen this work. And in line with what Jean and Silme fought for to unite struggles, we've seen the power in bringing together our movements, the power of the intersectionality between what we fight for as women, as people of color, as immigrants and refugees, as workers and union members. We see the power of fighting back against capitalism and the dollarization of our communities. We see this power when we see organizations like the farm workers movement, who is the women farm Farm workers movement asked the women union actors to stand up and lift up their voice and only because of the women farm workers um, union and the union actors standing together that's where we got the times up movement And we see here locally that when workers, especially in sectors dominated by immigrants and women and people of color and low wage workers, when we band together, we win. Let's take a few examples. Let's give it up for the hotel workers who are predominantly women and people of color and immigrants in a very dangerous situation who fought and won Initiative 124 to protect their industry and their comrades. Let's give it up for the retail and food sector workers who won secure scheduling in this community because it is an injustice to not be able to take time off to pick your kiddo up from work because you don't know what your schedule is. We here collectively in Seattle and this state are winning and those wins are rippling throughout the country. You all made it possible for every single worker in this state to win sick leave, paid sick and safe leave, and increase the minimum wage with initiative 1433. And it's not just wins on the ballot or wins um, in terms of changing laws and policies. It's wins on the strike line. It's wins for contracts. Let's give it up for the Teamsters school bus drivers who just won their contract. And notably, Notably, it's important um, to recognize the, the historic significance of this. I just learned today from Teamsters that this is the first national win for subcontracted school bus drivers to ever get health care and pensions in their contract because all work has dignity. And just this week, we saw the postdocs at the University of Washington demand to have a union once, um, and they, they sat in at the president's office. They didn't leave until a date would be set so that they could bargain for a contract. Give it up for the union postdoc workers who are here today. 
So the message is clear. When workers are united, even in the face of forces that are working diligently to divide us and strip us of our rights, when we fight back, we win. When workers are united, we win. And we will continue to learn from the work done by Jean and Silmi that it, by rooting our movements, by rooting our labor organizing in global movements, thinking broadly about the intersectionality of our labor struggle, not just within the city, not just within the state or the country, but internationally, that is how we build international worker solidarity and meet the definition when we say an injury to one is an injury to all, because this this crosses all borders. So I'll end by sort of um, saying that I think the lessons of Jean and Silme couldn't be more important um, to our movement because now more than ever we have forces that are trying to divide us. The victories that we've won have only been accomplished because we, fought, we found that intersectionality between immigrant rights and women's rights and standing up for workers' rights. We must remember sort of the vision that um, I think we see on the Washington State Labor Council mural. How many folks have seen the Washington State Labor Council mural which features the cannery workers? It shows the, the um, intergenerational, multi um, uh, uh, cultural and I think intersectional struggles that have united our movements over time right here in this city. So if you haven't seen it, I, I encourage you to take a look. And when we think about our movements, it's not just a hashtag. It's not just hashtag me too or hashtag Black Lives Matters or hashtag Union Strong or hashtag not one more. It is a movement and we have to remember it requires us coming out of our homes, coming to meetings like this, taking over the street and taking over positions of political power because that is how we will actually win the day. Jean and Silme were rooted in the struggle of the Philippines in the same way that our movements here in Seattle are tied to global struggles of marginalized people. We know that our victories here in Seattle are only going to help other cities and communities across the country. And we talk a lot about how our movement here in Seattle affects other cities and municipalities and the laws that they pass. But the world is watching. The world is waiting for us to act. The world is waiting for us to show what it looks like to stand up and fight back against Trump and his attacks on workers and the austerity that we see day to day. And I think the world is wondering how we will root our movements and those who are truly at the center of uh, the resistance by making sure that we root our movements around women, people of color, immigrants, and union workers. We have the ability to win. This is no one else's responsibility but ours to take forward the lessons that we've learned in this book, in the previous struggles that you've all been part of, because as, um, as Representative Sharon Tomiko Santo said, these folks were united, pulled together by tragedy, and we're pulled together here by fascism, by oppression, by austerity, and daily attacks. And if Seattle has shown over the last course of the last few years, we will continue to win when we fight back. This is our job. This is our responsibility. We are setting the history now. When we come together and fight, we will win. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. Our next speaker is another shining star in our community, Nikita Oliver. <laughs> Nikita is part of the People's Party and is fighting for the rights of workers and for the marginalized people in our communities to give them voice and to give them power. And she herself ran for mayor <laughs> We're proud that she did that, and she is going to share, um, I hope, maybe some spoken word. She's also an artist with us tonight. So before I speak, I see a lot of aunties in the room, so I wanted to ask permission to speak first. Will one of y'all grant me permission, please? Thank you. Um, 
Today feels like a very heavy day. Um, seeing another murder of an unarmed black man in Sacramento, uh, another school shooting in Maryland and a bombing in Austin. <clears throat> I have a lot of feelings today. And so as I thought about what to say, I couldn't help but think about the connections I see in the world now, and the world in 1981, and the world before that. So before I do share a poem, I want to share some of those connections that I see. Uh, I also first want to start by acknowledging that we are standing on occupied land in the Coast Salish territories. I want to acknowledge that any conversation about justice that doesn't include doing more than acknowledging that, but rectifying that, uh, is only justice in part, and justice in part is not justice in whole. And we deserve justice in whole. So I don't know if y'all know, but in 1989, the Treaty of Paris uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines were sold to the United States by Spain for $20 million, which is roughly the equivalent of $588 million today, if you can actually sail land in that way. <clears throat> and as I was thinking about Jean and Selma's story, activists, organizers, part of the labor movement and the Asian identity movement murdered at the age of 29 years old, I couldn't help but see myself and the many organizers that I work with every day in their story. We live in a world where the FBI openly talks about having a category for uh, black identity extremist. And we don't really know what that means or who's on that list. And I can only imagine that in 1981 they had a similar list for a lot of different groups, a lot of different people. And I want to acknowledge that I have the the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of so many elders so that I have the sight to see farther and be wiser. Folks like Jean and Selma who gave their lives so that we could do the work that we're doing today. So my hope in drawing these connections is so that we can think about what are the ways in which today we still contribute to US imperialism and the impact that that has in places like the Philippines. I can't help but think about how the Marcos regime murdered lots of comrades. And we live in a world where our current regime in the United States, a 45 regime, um, openly talks about admiring what Duarte is doing in the Philippines now. Where since 2016, 20,000 people have been killed in this fictitious war on drugs. And how Trump talks about that is something he admires. And the connection between uh, Trump and Duarte and what this U.S. imperialism is doing on a global level similar to what the council member was talking about and how we have to acknowledge that our struggles are interrelated. Is that not what the lives of Jean and Selma teach us? I can't help but think about the zeal of young people who look at our elders and we desire to live in the same unapologetic way right now in this time acknowledging that we have the opportunity to build beyond u.s imperialism and so i wanted to share with you some of the work that gabriella seattle and onik bayan are doing that's drawing attention to what is happening in the philippines now there is a movement called malaya it means free and there's going to be a group coming to Seattle May 1st through the 5th where they will talk about stopping the killings in the Philippines. But more importantly for us, the United States, they're going to show us what are the lines in which we are contributing to the murders of people in the Philippines, of young folks ages 13, 16, 17, 29, 33, and older who are trying to stand up against capitalism, who are trying to stand up for democracy. We believe in democracy, right? I can't help but think about how the people in this room, if you're here to celebrate and commemorate truth telling, you must believe in telling the whole story and the value that telling the whole story, how it brings us towards justice. That's why we're petitioning the FBI, correct? I can't help but think about how the FBI must have known what was going to happen, maybe even colluded, maybe even contributed, and maybe that's the reason why they don't want to give us those records. 
I can't help but think about how those same things happen to my elders and my community, and I believe those things are probably still happening today. I can't help but think about what it means to have power and privilege and influence and how we use it, or how we have so many bold young people in our nation. March for Lives is beautiful, but where did you stand on Black Lives Matter? I can't help but think about Maru Mora, a human rights activist being targeted by the federal government for deportation proceedings and can't help but think about how Seattle Police Department policed our rally to protest those deportation proceedings in a city that calls itself a sanctuary city. See, locally, we're still invested in the structure of militarization. I can't help but think about how militarized our police force is or how our police force is used to sweep folks who have no access to housing because our city is unaffordable. I can't help but think about how those things are interconnected to capitalism because we value big business more than we do people's human dignity on this landmass and in the Philippines. So what I hope we'll think about when we read this book and we celebrate the really important work that these attorneys did and the struggle and the trauma that these families and our comrades have taken on to ensure that the truth is told, that we consider the roles that we play, not just in pursuing justice, but the roles that we play as Utah citizens in impeding justice. The roles that we play as people who benefit from a capitalist system and U.S. imperialism in places that we maybe have not always thought about and maybe have never seen. That if we're truly gonna be about doing more than just telling the story after the executions happen, but we're going to prevent them, we will figure out what role we play in preventing justice from occurring now, not just in part, but in whole. So I'm gonna close with this poem. Sorry, poems are to be spoke up close. <clears throat> and Auntie Cindy asked for this, so of course, I'm willing to do it. Let's go down to the river to pray. Studying about those good old days and who shall wear the golden crown. Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, family, let's go down, let's go down, don't you want to go down? Oh, family, let's go down, down to the river to pray. I can hear my auntie in the back of the chapel singing. My baba leans over to me and says, baby, let's go down to the river to pray. We make our way down into the valley. She points to the clouds and says, see where the water starts and the rain clouds, how it makes its way down the mountainside into the valleys below, how it settles in the place where it's most needed. You must learn to settle in the place where you are most needed. She tells me I must learn to be like water, that my body is made mostly of water, that I must learn to watch how water moves over, around, or through a thing if it has to, that I must learn to move over, around, or through a thing if, it, if I have to. She tells me that water, me, and justice are one in the same thing that justice is just us being just us without us there is no justice and just in case I didn't hear she leans in closer and says justice is just us being just us without us there is no justice without us there is no resistance without us the system persists in its defiance dividing us further from the divinity that is our unity with mother earth dividing us further from the divinity that is our unity with each other see that's when cash rules everything around me as the man is steadily auctioning off stock in my body, steadily blocking my attempts to break free. Understand there can be no free trade agreements when black and brown bodies are still sold as stocks and bonds and jail cells sell out as politicians are building their wealth on these black and brown bodies. Markedly marketed, 
targeted, murdered, extrajudiciously with impunity, not just locally, but globally, by the same hands that stole my people from our homelands, the same hands that brought us to someone else's homelands, the same hands that'll feed us back to these lands, overprocessed and overpriced till we become underfed. But yo, 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 I come from a resilient people, a still living people, a still here people. We are still here, people. In the land of the free, the home of the slave. Shit, I keep getting that wrong. The land of the free, the land of the free, the home of the brave. Wait, is anyone looking for the braves amongst us? They are not missing, but we've made them invisible in our histories. We don't ask, so they never have to tell the truth. Did anyone ask why the rivers around us run red with blood? We don't ask, so they never have to tell the truth. See, I think it's these politics, politics. Many blood-sucking politicians with the only thing redder than their fangs is their blood-stained hands. Look at them, elbow deep in the cookie jar, call it capitalism. Who pays the toll for the feudalism while the rest of us race to the bottom in chains and body bags to be buried much more than six feet deep under more fair trade agreements where the only thing fairly traded is our rage against a machine that would make us believe you can never have enough. You will never be enough. Understand enough is 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 enough when we say it is enough. There's always been enough if we would just share. My Baba leans over to me. She says, sweetie, I want you to look in the water. Tell me what you see. And I tell her, I see my reflection. She says, yes, baby, you see your reflection. And you must learn to love the woman in the water because justice is what love looks like in public. And if you cannot love yourself, you cannot love anyone else. And if you cannot love yourself or anyone else, you cannot be justice and understand that justice is just us. Being just us, without us, there is no justice. So without love, without love, there is no justice. Understand that water, love, Justice, you are one and the same, and they must move over, around, or through a thing if they have to. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita, that was fabulous, <laughs> really. And I'm so proud of these young women rising up. Yeah. It gives us hope for the future, truly. And it's not just here, but you know, we've seen a rise of the young students leading the way, leading us, and that's what needs to happen. So thank you. On behalf of Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who could not be here with us tonight but has sent these remarks, she wanted to share these remarks because she believes it is so important to mark the release of Mike's book and to join us in celebrating the lives and legacies of Selmi Domingo and Jean Vernis. As your member of Congress, Congress and throughout her career as an activist and organizer, Congresswoman Jayapal has fought every day for the rights of workers, for immigrants, and for policies that uphold human rights here and around the world. That work is built on the shoulders of warriors for justice like Jean and Selmy. And 40 years almost after their passing, we're still fighting their battles. She shares the following words. The book being launched today, Summary Execution, by my friend and another incredible fighter for justice in his own right, Michael Withy, unravels the story of Jean and Selmy Domingo's killings. And it reminds us that 37 years ago, on up through today, our countries and communities are all connected to one another that the injustices we face as workers and immigrants 
and communities of color are intersectional and overlapping across oceans and borders. Honoring the work they did and understanding precisely how Selmy and Jean were targeted enables us to nurture and protect the young Selmys and Jeans of today who are working to advance our civil and human rights here in our city. It enables us to learn from history so that we can change it because the reality is there are some alarm, alarming parallels. Then as now, there is a kinship between terrible militaristic right-wing leaders in the United States and in the Philippines. Back then it was Reagan and Marcos. Today it's Trump and Duterte. Then as now, the United States pays lip service to human rights, but in so many places around the globe, it funds and arms regimes who abuse them. Then as now, labor unions are coming under attack and wealth and inequity are widening. So as you all know, we certainly have our work cut out for us, but this book and this gathering tonight of so many leaders who are following in Jean and Selmy's footsteps shows us that our fight is very much alive. Seattle has always been an epicenter of resistance, and as an organizer, I am an internal optimist. I am confident that no matter what anyone might do to intimidate or oppress, we will not let go of one another. We will have each other's backs, and we will build the kind of equitable and inclusive democracy that Gene and Selmy were fighting for. All right, without further ado, it's my privilege and honor to introduce Mike Withy. <laughs> I am. You know, my, <laughs> Mike uh, was not just our lawyer. He was our friend, he was our comrade, and he was solid from day one, from the minute the murders happened. Mike was there at the hospital asking questions, <laughs> listening, watching, and plotting. And he continued to do that every step of the way. And as Cindy said, he had an incredible memory. Me and Cindy still have to, you know, ask each other, is that what really happened? Is that <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we can't remember all the facts the way Mike does. But I'm so happy that Mike wrote this book and that our history is being told, and that Mike's just, Mike, who he is, and I love you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, <laughs> it was made to look like a dispute over dispatch. Hot-headed Filipinos shooting it out in the local union hall. Vicious thuggery. No one was supposed to survive that hail of bullets. No one would live to tell. The gun was an execution piece used for only one thing, killing people. It would be cheap, it would be easy, it would be over with. No one would know, and no one would tell. But someone did live. The first thing these perpetrators didn't count on was Selmy Domingo, as his whole life passed before his eyes in the seconds after that hail of bullets. Selmy Domingo had one thing in mind. There's one last thing I must do. My life must not be in vain. The principles and ideals I fought for were worth living for and dying for. Selmy said to himself that the perpetrators of this foul crime must be brought to justice. It was his last wish, and we must answer it. Imagine the incredible courage it took Selmy Domingo to get out of his chair with four 45 caliber bullet holes in him. 
to see his best friend Jean bleeding out on the floor next to him, to get out into the street and hail a fireman to say those words that would eventually unlock the mystery of what happened on June 1st, 1981. Those two words, Ramil and Galoy. It was that instant that the murder conspiracy began to unravel. Not just for the hitmen, not just for Dictato and Boyd Pillai, but for those who put him up to it, for those who stood in the shadows, for those who were covering their tracks. But of course, it did not unravel by itself. The other thing the perpetrators of these murders did not count on was the courage and tenacity of Terry Mast and Cindy Domingo and Barbara Viernes and the entire Viernes. As Jeff could recall, those were the words of my closing argument before that jury. I want to take you back to June 5th, 1981, in the first Local 37 meeting after the murders. And the Rag and File Committee think we, need, think we needed to establish the new dispatch procedures and the new team. Can you imagine Dave Della, John Foz, and Glenn Sassone, who stood up and said, I will be the dispatchers for this union, despite the fact that Gene was just murdered. What incredible courage they showed that day. It wasn't easy going back into that union hall. We debated it. Should we go back in? So we wanted to let folks know we were back and we weren't gonna give the union up to the thugs and the gangsters. There was Tony Baruso, even as of June 5th, we had strong suspicions that Baruso was behind these murders. And there in the audience was Boy Pillai of the Tucson Gang and Boise Campo, their pieces in their pockets. Here's how I describe the scene when Baruso started the meeting talking about how the union was gonna get folks up to be dispatched. I'll never forget this. Russo, there are those who are claiming that Gene and Selmy were anti-Marcos. I can tell you that President Marcos had nothing to do with these murders. <laughs> Terry and I looked at each other surprised. At that point, nobody even talking about Bar Marcos committed the murders. <laughs> Baruso, however, was still talking. We have made changes to make this union stronger and better, and we're going to continue to reform this union. A thunderous bang hit the table. The already tense scene as Terry slammed her hand down on the table in front of her and shouted, No! Silence filled the room for a minute, and it broke into tumult. Boise and Pili reached in for their pieces, and I waited for them to pull out their firearms but their hands stayed inside their jackets and Terry continued glaring at Peruso. I will not yet let you stand up here and claim credit for Gene and Selmy's years of hard work. You fought us every step of the way and we are not going to take this anymore. That is the character of the leadership that the Committee for Justice had. Such is the de steely determination by Terry Mast Undaunted determination of my heroine, our leader, Terry Mast. Now, Cindy Domingo edited a wonderful book about the Union of Democratic Filipinos called A Time to Rise. And it contains the remembrances of many KDP members, a few of us, about their days in the fight against Marcos for cases uh, that they were doing the justice efforts and the personal recollections of the day. And Cindy wrote a very moving remembrance of her brother and her struggles that was called The Long Road to Justice that ended with this sentence. My only wish now is that Mike Withy would come to me today and tell me that a piece of damning evidence has surfaced revealing the U.S. complicity in the murders 
without any hesitation, I know that Mike and I would be ready to organize again and write the final chapter of this book. And folks, such is the leadership and determination of Cindy Domingo for 37 years in the fight for justice in this case. Well, guess what? The day Cindy talked about in her book has come. Last Wednesday, we went to the FBI office in Seattle because it's not coming clean about what they knew about the FBI informant that was sent, yes, Nikita, was sent to the scene of the murders before the murders happened, knowing it was going to happen. Who then came forward in an effort to exonerate the hitman, our FBI. So we brought our justice petition. People, this is a launch party, but you know what it's a launch for? It's for a new campaign to hold the FBI accountable for these murders. That's what we're launching tonight. So, we went with Sharon Maeda, we, and Cindy and Terry and I went up there. And after a while of security measures, et cetera, et cetera, they, they brought a young, a young rookie down. The FBI day agent came down and he read the petition back up in Tyrrell and he asked, well, when were these murders? I said, 1981. He goes, well, you know, I was three years old. So I said, um, yeah, well, look it up. And they asked, well, what crime was supposedly committed? I said, well, what we're here for is obstruction of justice. He said, by who? I said, by the Seattle office of the FBI. Oh. So he took and wrote notes and said, oh, okay, I see. So thanks to our recent FOIA efforts, freedom of information efforts that Sharon and I have brought, we now have a lot of information we didn't have before and that we are determined over the next, however long it takes, I was about to say 37 years, but <laughs> Cindy wouldn't let me do that. Because the FBI is now covering up the, the office, Seattle office's role in these murders. After saying they had 1,500 pages, then we'll give them in seven months, then they said they had 1,100 pages, we'll give them in 22 months. Now they have 1,276 pages, but guess what? It's all in the Seattle office of the FBI related to this informant. Now they had 42 federal agents, FBI agents, investigating the Domingo Vernus murders. You think one of them might have heard about this FBI informant being at the scene of the murders? You think one of them may have heard that this guy, their informant, went in to perjure himself to let the hitman off and let the Marcos regime off? I think so. That's what we're about. That's what we're going to do. We're going to fight this petition in the courts. We're going to fight it in the streets. We've got to get to the bottom of these murders because there are questions we have, and they need to be answered. Selmy deserves an answer. Gene Vernus deserves an answer to how our government could perpetrate this horrendous crime. So please sign the petition. There's people here with the petition. Please sign us. As Cindy and Terry said in 1981, we are not going to rest until we've held everyone liable and responsible. So share with the organizations that you're part of and share with your friends. Folks, there's so many people to thank. And I don't have more than a few minutes to wrap this up because we're about to hear from the labor chorus. But I do want to thank my incredibly beautiful wife, Stella McClure Withy, for giving me the support and emotional support to write this book. To our incredible legal team, Liz Schott, John Coughlin Presente, Jim Douglas Presente, Jeff Robinson, thank you so much for coming back from New York, Jeff. Our law clerks have been mentioned, Howard Goodfriend, Sharon Sakamoto is here, Yvonne Ward. The researchers on my book, Blair um, and Andrea, my daughter Lisa Michaud, 
worked on this book, Andr Andrea Branicki, my book team, my editors here, Beth, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Carolyn Anderson, who's been absolutely uh, fabulous in, our, in support. Randy Alleman, who wrote a book report. Peter Danella, who wrote a book report. And the great lawyer and civil rights lawyer who represented Gene and Selmy and Demisio back in the 1970s, fighting the race discrimination case, Michael Fox, please stand up. What a giant in our community. Thank you, Michael. So look at what the justice movement has built. Look at the, we've got Jenny Durkin and Nikita Oliver in the same room at the same time. And I, I want to thank the speakers, what an incredible contribution they've all made in their lives. Um, but the book is a commemoration of the lives and work, but an affirmation. What is the legacy Gene and Selmy built? How do we define it? Well, who they stood with and what they stood for. That's what this book commemorates. And you think about it, how young we all were. 29 years old. And Gene's meeting with the head of the largest union federation of the Philippines. And Gene and Selmy are passing resolutions of their union to look at the Marcos regime. So this book is for the millennials. It's for the people in the People's Party, as well as everybody in this room, to learn those lessons and understand that they need to be applied to the struggle. So I want to honor some people. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you are in the Union of Democratic Filipinos, this revolutionary organization that led this with de dedication and discipline, please stand up and be recognized. <laughs> All of you. If you were in the Committee for Justice, for Domingo and Veronis, please stand up. Stay standing. If you were in the Labor Employment Law Office, Legacy of Equality, please stand up. Please stay standing. If you were with the the uh, labor movement, please stand up. If you're in the labor movement, if you are in the ACLU who supported our effort from the beginning, if you're a trial lawyer, please stand up. If you are part of the new organizations to take on Black Lives Matter, mass incarceration, the People's Party, LILO, the Alliance for Resistance and Power, please stand up. If you're a supporter of our efforts, please stand up. Selma Domingo and Jean Viernes! Selma Domingo and Jean Viernes! Selma Domingo and Jean Viernes! Thank you all very much. The workers' blood shall run, there will be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Work with force of art is greater than the jungle faith of one, for union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Everybody, solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Strong. We never toil to earn, but without our mind of power, we never sing the world in turn. We can break their body power. We can gain what learn, but the union makes us strong. strong solidarity forever solidarity forever solidarity forever for the union makes us strong 
Let's hear it for the Labor Chorus. Thank you, everyone. Uh, there are books out front still. More books. Get your copy.